Oh, I'm Chris. Uh, my real name is Krzysztof, but I'm, I'm not bothering you, bothering you for proper, proper pronunciation of my name. I'm a data architect and a deputy of Data Processing Center in Geneva in the European Space Mission called Gaia. Uh, I'm going to tell the story from the perspective of the Postgres X user. Initially, this presentation was, was done for the first day of this, of this conference, for the Postgres XC Summit. Uh, we established some links with, with Koichi for, of Postgres XC. Uh, right now, also with Mason from Postgres XL. But I would like to, to, to tell you a few, few words about the mission itself, what kind of approach we have to, to attack the problem we have with Postgres XC in the background. So I'm going to f say a few words about the mission itself. The science we do in Geneva, which is slightly different than the rest of the, of the consortium. And then I uh, have a few words about data model, hardware, how I see XC role, you know, Excel role, or cl clustered Postgres in, in, in our scope, and then collaboration. So a few words about myself. I put the bio, I never do this, but in this context I thought it could be um, fruitful because I was, for a long time, I was a lot of ob object-oriented databases. So I've heard about Postgres during studies uh, when I was really thinking about uh, the world ruled by object-oriented databases. And um, in fact, I came to CERN after a few years of my professional career to pursue the biggest database, object-oriented database, than ever. And the first thing I've done was migration to relational da database Oracle. Uh, as far as I know, it's still the biggest relational stuff uh, scientifically run uh, at CERN. Um, it's, at the time, it was over 10 years ago, it was run on 12 or 13 machines. So it was sh shredding down through, through something similar to foreign data wrappers. Uh, and the thing's still, still running. Then I joined the, the Gaia uh, group in, in Geneva that does variability studies. And I'm going to tell, tell a few things what variability studies are in this context. <coughs> what is Gaia mission? So Gaia is right now quite important mission for, for the whole astronomical society because no such a mission is going to be pursued for the next 20, 30 years, maybe even more. Recently, the NASA canceled a similar mission. And the main goal is to do the census of the galaxy. That means to see as far as we can, uh, to study the, the stars, all the objects that we have in our galaxy. And all the objects between the magnitude of 6 and 20, 20 means 20 of magnitude means this is this is the light emitted by the observed by us, which is 400 more or less 400,000 le, less 400,000 uh, times uh, fainter than what we see uh, normally, and uh, we want to, uh, to also also f forward um, track down the asteroids, quasars. We want to to see what kind of supernovae could happen during the mission. The, the mission itself is five years old, five years long. Uh, and this is important, actually, I should say that 20th magnitude means we, we're going to observe 1 billion stars. Recently, there were some de debates that the, the, the satellite was launched in December. If not to bump it to 21 uh, magnitude, that would mean 2, 2 billion stars, which is obviously bad news for, for, from the data perspective because you need two times more space and maybe processing time. So it's not going to happen. There are some problems, but actually, this is still very, very, very good. Um, uh, Gaia has a lot of features that are very, very interesting. Just to make you understand what kind of precision we're talking about, if we put Gaia on the, on the Earth and we place on more or less one dime on the, on the Moon, Gaia will be able to, to see it still. Or you could see the, the, the hair from 1,000 kilometers, more or less. This is the, the precision we're talking about. So there's a lot of problems related to the scientific engineering part. Um, and there are some byproducts, like we may expect 10,000 exoplanets being <coughs> discovered. And what is very important for, for us in Geneva is that estimated number of variables from the whole stars we're going to see to observe is 10, 20 percent. That means 100 to 200 million of stars are going to be variables. And then we, if we find out that some star is a variable, we're going to devote a significant time to look at it. <coughs> Gaia instruments. So another special thing about Gaia is we have two mirrors. Normally when you think about a satellite or any kind of telescope, you usually have one mirror and you have one CCD. But in this case we have two mirrors that through other intermittent mirrors point to the one big CCD. This is one gigapixel camera. So this is the biggest ever made CCD camera and right now it's in the space. And because of this fact that we have two mirrors, 
we have to keep the basic angle at constant uh, degree so we know what we're looking at because otherwise we would be we couldn't actually map properly and understand what we're looking looking at and because of that the the torus is built so, such that it's super stable in the, in the thermal conditions that are in the space. So there's some animation. Hope it starts. Yep. I'm not sure if it's visible. Is it? Okay. So we see two mirrors on the torus. We normally guy will be spinning all the time. I'm, go I'm going to show you a bit more about this later. Spinning, spinning over five years, it's going to spin several times the whole sky. Every six months, the whole sky is scanned. The light goes through, through one mirror, second mirror, and ends up in the, on the CCD. This is important. The, the fact that it spins is very important because there is a lot of spinning involved here. First, we spin around the, the, sun, the, the sun, then when the well, sun is moving, we're spinning around the sun. Uh, we're spinning around uh, the Earth. We have actually special orbit. I'm going to, to show you what kind of orbit it is. It's also different than the usual satellite you, you've heard about. Uh, this is the mirror. Normally, when, we, or when any serious scientific satellite is built, there are two satellites built. First, you do your stuff. You learn on your mistakes. And you put the thing aside, start from scratch. But in this case, the creation, especially of the mirrors, is so complicated, so time consuming, that only one satellite was built. So if something would go wrong on the, during the launch, we would have a problem. Everything went well. For the last four months, the satellite is there. It's still in the commissioning phase. But uh, there are still some problems. So for example, um, scientists didn't envision that some type of ice could be, <coughs> some residue of ice could, uh, could gather in the, in the tent of the satellite, which affects the light that we observe. So there's a number of issues still unsolved, but apparently this is not that big problem. And it's not a stopper yet. Another thing, the satellite, when you think about satellite, it's usually geostationary satellite, which is pretty close to the, to the, to the Earth. In this case, we are in Lagrangian, po Lagrangian point 2. This is the point where we have two such a points, L1 and L2, two points where the gravity forces of Earth and the Sun equalize themselves. So this is the point when you don't when you, once you're there, you kind of wobble around, and sorry, and uh, when we're spinning, you can observe the the whole sky without being uh, eclipsed by the by the Earth for ever. So you there's no danger of of your batteries running out because you are, you run out of juice because the, the there was uh, there was eclipse on your uh, on your solar panels. It's this is a very important thing that, that the satellite spins, but also has precession. So this axis also is changing the, the angle. And this causes a um, very peculiar way we look at the sky. So imagine that we're spinning. We're changing the, the precession. This axis is changing. But every normally, the spin one turn like this, or like you see, it's, it's more or less six hours. And you see, we start with one point of view, then the second point of view. And it rotates, rotates, sort of rotates, slowly scanning the stripes of the sky. Every six months, the whole sky is scanned. What kind of science we can do with this? A lot of science. We are mostly, we in Geneva are concentrated on the, on the variability based from photometry. I'm going to explain what it is. But first of all, it's all about creating a, a catalog of stars in three dimensions. So we know more or less how our galaxy looks like. This is the, the, the vision of the, of the artist from, from, from the side and then from the top, let's say. You see this is, this is sun, this is us. And this is the color shows you, this is the heat map show, showing you how much stars, how, much ob how many objects you could see through the galaxy. There's an interesting artifact here. So this is actually simulation from the, from the Nordemastrum, the supercomputer from Barcelona. And it turns out that we have the extension here. That means we can see further, deeper into the, the, the center of the galaxy. Mm. Another thing, well, how we can do this, how we can see so much deeper, how could we construct the 3D model of the galaxy? This is all about parallax. So just imagine I'm standing here, I'm looking at you, and I'm moving, like the guy is moving, and I see a different angle. I see this, this exactly the thing that's happening here. Some people are moving faster than the others. You're moving much faster than the guys at the end of the, of the, of the room. 
And this is how, by calculation, by triangulation, we are able to, to understand what's going on if it comes to distribution of the objects in the galaxy. So this is one thing. The other thing is, I think everybody recognizes this. What is that, right? If, if you live on the northern hemisphere, it's in Sursa Maius. The idea is to why we need to, to, to why we want to understand with a 3D uh, map of the galaxy because it's it's cool. It's, it gives you a lot of information about what we are, what what the galaxy formation uh, rules are there, and what's the future of the space, and so on. So we can do a lot of science. <coughs> One some of the science is stellar astrophysics, galactic structure, which was shown like before, reference frame. Maybe I should also show this one that, mm, no. okay. But you could see at the end of the animation that some stuff could be, is moving in some different directions. So we don't know actually exactly how the, how the matter in our galaxy is moving, what directions are affected. By che checking both the 3D map and the speed or the gradient of the, of the, of the movement of, of specific objects or parts of the galaxy, we can understand how the, how the whole thing, thing is working, which could help us also with understanding of fundamental physics. And there's dark matter question. It also should help us to understand how, how the dark matter affects and what it is, uh, the, the galaxy and, and the space. How Gaia works? First of all, we see the light that we see is, is observed light. We have to remember that what we see is not necessarily what would happen because of all this motion that we involve uh, involved in. So first we, we observe the emitted light, then we digitalize it, and then we send a stream which is compressed to the earth of the, of this, of the information. So CCD is really responsible for, for, for digitizing this, this information like that. And then there's a pretty powerful video processing unit on board that does the rest. But a lot of stuff is happening on the earth. Uh, and us in Geneva, we are at the end of the food chain, in fact. This is example. This is actually the the CCD. As you see, CCD is created is is composed of multiple other small CCDs. We have star mappers to each four different mirror, mirror one, mirror two, star mapper. And then we have the the real thing that observes. So, uh, and then we have the spectrometers. So you you, you have different. Sorry, we have we have uh, the filters with the, for CCDs with different uh, visual bands because this is visible light. This is blue. This is red. And then we have radio velocities. So radio velocities also give you, this is the, this thing that gives you the, um, the, the, the idea about how things are moving away or closer to us. And imagine that we expect some window here. So, okay, so star is coming. It's entering the field of view. Star map detects it. And basically then there is the whole logic in the video processing unit that tracks the star once it was detected by the star mapper. It takes more or less 40 seconds, four seconds per, per one column. Uh, the whole thing takes 40 seconds to, to scan. So it's doing boring thing all the time, the same thing. The, 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 the exciting thing about it is that it has to be super precise. So for example, <coughs> also there was a problem recently that satellite is fainter than they expected, 10 times fainter. <laughs> and in order to, to calibrate the data that goes from the, comes from the satellite, we need Millimeter precision. We have to know up to millimeter in the space, even if it's 1.5 mi million kilometers from us, was the position. So uh, there was upgrade for the for the telescopes that were that are used to track it. Okay, so it's 40, 45 seconds. And us as a scientists, we this is what we see. This is also after some chain of processing. This is we call it calibration, and and actually we this is not what we get. This is what we what we start processing with. But in order to get it, there are a few additional steps, which is, which is called the reconstruction of the time series, because we are the only ones in the consor consortium that are interested in the things that are time series, so time oriented. So this is uh, for the astronomer, normal astronomer, if they, if they see this, they probably know what kind of object is that. The human eye is so good that if, if it's trained and the human brain is so good that by looking at this, these things, uh, you could probably say what is that. But you would have to spend a lot of time. So what's, what's usually happening is that you fold it. And fold it over the period that you find. So for, from our perspective, the major work, scientific work, is to find if the, the object is constant or it's variable, and if it's variable, if it's periodic or not. 
And then if it's periodic or not, then you can do start your, your real science which is classification. But the finding period, so you can see period of four days here, these are these are day these are days in phase. So this is a period of one point five and so on. Uh, so we, sorry, so this is the, 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 the in phase, so it means that one means four days, right? Here would be seven days. Here would be five days, here would be eight days, one and so on. But we see this is repetitive thing. So this is special type of objects which is called cephates. They are very nice because they are sinusoid like. Uh, they have sinusoid like proper property. Mm, and yes, finding out this period is, is time consuming. It takes more or less two, three seconds per object. So you can calculate easily. You have four, three, four uh, time series per, per object. We have to do period search on all of them. It gives quite some time. So it's days of processing at least. So our ultimate goal is comparable with the previous mission that guys based on. It was called Hipparchos. And Tycho was the, the, the Earth kind of follow-up of Hipparchos. And every astronomer that works with uh, photometric data has the full catalog on his shelf. It's a number of books. It's probably around 20 books uh, that consists the whole catalog. In this catalog, you have this light curves I showed you before and some attributes that are calculated derived from the both light curves, parallax, and metallicity from colors and so on. And what we have for Gaia, what we plan for Gaia is to have similar catalog. Around, probably it's a bit later now, it's 2022. So at the end of the mission, uh, actually this, this mission ended in 93 and the catalog was published in 97. So Gaia finishes around 2021, 22. Uh, I hope we can get it on, on time. So the idea is to once the final data is sent, processed and categorized, we want to publish the, the catalog. But it would take much bigger shelf, right? <laughs> so, hard. Um, remember I showed you how the Gaia spins and moves? So this is the data, first kind of data look, or big data look and, on what's, what's happening. Here we have the number of observations, so how long your time series is, depending on what point in, on the sphere you look. And you can see there are certain parts of them from the beginning, from the day zero, are more, more dense with the data. The time series are longer than elsewhere. So we have non-uniform look on the, on the, on the, on the sky. Mm, that means that the, the science we do with the time series is not comparable with what we've seen before if it comes to, to processing. We don't have equal, equally sampled time series. We have to really model, we have to do a lot of stuff to model properly the time series. And there's a lot of factors that affect how you, how you see or how you model your time series. So there is a, a lot of research done, done for that. And you see after five years, so this is nominal time of the mission, if the, we have enough fuel, uh, to, and fuel is used to correct the, the orbit, and make slight corrections. There are some, another interesting science that we have micro thrusters. One thrusters, thruster power uh, force given is comparable to the one, to the one of, of the B, just to make it super precise. Uh, so again, maybe I go back. We see that on average we have, on average, we don't see here, but on average we have 80 observations per, per source. But it varies from 40, or actually 30 to 250. And the global data flow. So we have telemetry. So this is the, the guys that gathered data from the satellite. And there is a lot of science before and we, until we, we get there. The, the data is distributed in, in custom format which is pretty dumb. This is the uh, Java serialized object in, objects in fact, and that are, that are compressed. And this is really hard to read from the, from the data perspective. This is horrible because you spend most of the time unzipping. There's no really any ordering. So as I said, we are special because we want time series. But for most of these guys, they don't care about the time ordering. They see the transit and the source, and they're able to, to derive the, the science from that. Basically, they, they calculate scholars. But we have to... Uh, reconstruct the time series to, in order to operate for, on that. Uh, from the Postgres perspective, this is interesting because uh, we started from more or less zero four years ago, five years ago, and right now everything runs on Postgres with a lot of extensions, a lot of things around it. So I'm going to speak about this later. But also other units could be interested, especially in the Postgres XC, because they have slightly, pos slightly similar problems. Especially CU9 could be interesting for Postgres because this is, uh, this is the catalog. This is the shelf I showed you before. 
uh, that's going to stay there for years and years. So if this thing runs on Postgres, I think this is good for Postgres as well because it's going to be there for many years to come. Um, the group is distributed over all over Europe. I work here, but we have a lot of uh, active, well, we don't have that many active people, but we have a number of affiliates. And really the people who are dealing with data or, or creating software is around three, five. The rest are scientists. Mm. We have to distribute the data to many of these people who are outside of Geneva, so they, this is not necessarily Gaia data. We use a lot of data that is existing. Then there's a number of surveys that we base our research and, and development on. So people who, who did observations, both well, Hipparchos I, I showed you before, but there's 10 of others. Two or, two or three of them are very, very valuable because, because the classification they do is really good. And this is what, what is classification. So this is like Linus, Linus uh, tax taxonomy tree. You see that we, this is our, our own invention. Uh, we basically looking for species, we depending on the, the attributes, the, the way they behave, we want them to be classified. So we're starting from, from this, and we have a number of rules, and we're doing all this typical, maybe not typical, but analy anal analytical steps to find out what the things are. Mm. And some of them, most of them will be covered by Gaia. So we, a, we, we hope that even with this strange sampling I showed you of the sky, we can still find most of these types uh, through, the, through the processing, through, through, the, through the classification effort we have. Uh, so yes, there's a number of, 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 of gains that we get from this uh, when, we, when we have this, when we have this uh, classes uh, defined. But in the end, what we're doing is taking, we're taking the true classes. So I mentioned the existing surveys. I also should, should mention that for the, for the good astronomer, classification till now, till recently, was seeing these folded light curves and saying, oh, this must be that. They were looking at this, thinking, good astronomer could do this, could probably classify 300 objects per day. We have, let's say, 200 million if we do the first few filtering, so it's not going to cut. So what we're doing, we, for example, building classifiers based on the true class, which is the thing we, we got from astronomers. And then we, we build our classifiers, we predict, then we do, this is the, the, the cross-validation effort. So you see, this is what we classified, uh, classified the classes, so eclipsing binaries and so on, cephates. And this is true classes. Of course, not always true class is really true. So you have to be careful. But the idea is that this diagonal is, you have basically, you should have only stuff on this diagonal. This would be ideal situation from the scientific point of view. But it's not the case, and um, it takes a lot of iterations to understand why. OK, so what's the processing model? We have, I've showed you, we have this central repository that we get the data from. And this repository, once the data is, is given, we have to inject the data. Then we have to do time series reconstruction, which is unique for us. And this is uh, quite an effort from the data perspective. Then we have to do validation. We could use similar techniques I, I showed you before, like the, the confusion metrics, stuff like that, on the, on the subset, when we run the, our processing on a subset of the data. And then we do the proper processing. This is green because it could be repeated multiple times. So during the six months, we can do this many, many times because we find out that our parameters are wrong or we want to improve the, the algorithms, all these kind of uh, typical things that you do when, you do when you're dealing with unknown, because we're all the time dealing with unknown. And we also, I didn't mention, but we also want to create, to discover new classes, of course, of objects so, and, and add them to this taxonomy tree uh, if, if, if we find them. And I know this is not readable, it's just about the color. So this is one, let's say one cycle, one month processing. The green thing means this is the input data, but the red thing means this is, I'm sorry, the violet thing means that we, there's some human intervention or validation needed. So you see even through one, uh, during the one month, we have to do a lot of manual work. Manual means that we checking statistically, or we checking the metrics, if the metrics look uh, like, like we want. And again, this is the where Postgres is important for us because we do analytics using Postgres. So why we are big, big data? I like the taxonomy invented by Michael, Michael Stonebreaker, which defines big data as big volume, big velocity, and big variety. But you don't have to cover all of these three points. It's enough probably when you, when you cover one well enough. But if you cover two, then it means you probably big data. 
So why big velocity? Uh, we have these input files, which are called jbins. We have more or less 3,000 of them to get just photometry. We have also auxiliary, auxiliary data, but for photometry, we have more or less 3,000 files that are order of 10 megabytes big or small gigabytes big, a few, 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 few gigabytes each. As I said, this is CPU bound, so we have to distribute it. Um, uh, a lot of processing. In the end, solution, we load the stuff into intermediate partitions, probably distribute it if we use Postgres XC table. And we run a regression of SQL on this. This is the just example, very well, simplified, but not that much of how we reconstruct the time series. So this is important for this is really, uh, yes, this is the, the really long table, which has 10 to 11 times four, at least, times four uh, tuples. We join it with the source just to, for the cross check, and we do some, some stuff. It's more or less how it looks like. So of course, we have to partition that because otherwise we partition this and uh, we want to distribute it um, or parallelize it uh, with our in-house system if the Postgres XC or Excel doesn't work for us. And after such a query, we have more or less, in the input we have the big table, which is 2 to 10, 11, two, 10 to 11 observations. We ended up with 10 to 9 sources with ordered time series. Right, so this is reconstruction. We have more or less two, three days to, to do this. Variety, why we... We are not that, uh, we are not say SAP type of uh, uh, place, but we have 70 domain classes that are persisted. Not all of them, happily not all of them are, are mapped to, to tables. We're using OpenJPA for the mapping. And uh, so it's possible to doing, doing some tricks to fold it to more or less 20, 30 tables. But few of them are, or some of them are, mm, some of them are, be it could be replicated, so are not, they are not that big, but many of them have to be partitioned. Mm, we also have, if it comes to variety, we have data from other surveys. So we're using uh, entity attribute kind of data model as well for that, HStore and so on. Uh, volume. So as I mentioned, we, we have this input, but we also have this repeating uh, processing during the, this uh, one month window or six month window um, uh, when we generate the data because we generate output out all the time. So from this tens of terabytes on the input, we can generate easily hundreds of terabytes during one cycle and we have at least 10 cycles to go. So normally what we do, we keep the data from the cycle minus one from the previous cycle during the current cycle and we delete the, the rest. So it also probably indication that we, use, we should use kind of uh, partitioning to, to, to alleviate that. Mm. And this is, this is just a snapshot of data model from, from the Java perspective. The whole project, by definition, was decided by ESA is written in Java. Uh, but we smuggled, we pushed for, to, for using, for, for ability to having other tools. So right now we're using also R, GNU R, for, for ad hoc analytics. Uh, Postgres is perfect for that because we can embed R in Postgres. We can also, there's driver post, uh, for, for, R in, uh, for Postgres in R. We created some, some special utility functions to, to help it. But the point is here that we have the, the catalog. We can have multiple catalogs. We have subcatalogs. This is your samples that you eventually work on as a validation, for example. You don't take the uh, one billion uh, thing, but you start with specially sampled objects. And then you have sources. And here you should, you should see the time series. And then from time series, you have time series result, so, um, source result, time series result, and you have a bunch of other things. So uh, we're using OpenJPA, as I think I mentioned, and we have some custom mapping. So we have normal ORM Hibernate type, type uh, kind of mappings, but we also have embedded mappings uh, that use HStore or metadata. We have strange things to, in order to get rid of, of joints that are not probably needed. We have arrays, of arrays, of arrays of PG types mapped in, in, into Java. <coughs> attributes, so in the end, we end, end up uh, with a bunch of attributes. And, oh, sorry, it's not in the end. It's intermediate, intermediate uh, form is we have number of attributes that we want to use to classify. So big effort is, is being spent on how to find the attributes and basically limit the number of attributes. So they give you error rate of, on cross-validation. That means you check with the existing catalog from existing survey. You check with this classes that astronomers already provided for us for the same objects. Uh, and you want this, this number to be as low as possible. 
So you see that it doesn't really matter starting from some point over 10 attributes. If you add another attribute, your, your error rate is not really decreasing. You basically have threshold here. Of course, if you have less, then, then it doesn't look like that. But the point is here that you have to know what attributes are meaningful. And from all this processing, we have around 500 attributes. This is also important from the um, data perspective because this is the stuff that we cut on, this, let's say, 15 attributes, chosen attributes, because this is the, the way you make samples of your data. And this is how you, for example, this is one of the ways seeing what attribute is meaningful uh, for what class. So you see the classes here from this taxonomy tree. And here you see the attributes actually named. And the darker it is, the more important it is to find specific class. So for, for example, for LPVs, for long period variables, amplitude is very important, right? You can see. But for others, not so. Just one here is frequency error for, for delta scuti. It's quite complicated to, to invade data model, invent data model or to, to map this kind of um, dependencies, correlations, when you, will, when you know you have to do some cuts, you have to do some queries that gather specific data based on these attributes. And, we, and what we do? We do almost everything we do via SQL. And not everything I'm going to show you what not, but most of the things run on SQL, mostly on the, on the samples, but ideally we would like to run on everything. So this is one of the projections, this height of projection on, on some simulated data. You see already, even if you're not astronomer, you see the strange dots, right? The freckles. And that means data, data wasn't properly simulated. There are some basically holes with no data. But otherwise, we see the distribution is more or less what we expect from the scanning law that I showed you, showed you before. This is the, the number of elementary, number of, of, of uh, values from the time series that are distributed over the sky. And we're doing a bunch of other metrics. So all of this is done through, through SQL and then displayed in R. Uh, this is another one. So through the, mostly through the color and, and, and 2D histograms we, we, we're showing, or we're looking for some artifacts that, are, that have scientific uh, meaning. Oh, again, OK. Not only uh, SQL, we also do complex even processing. So we have now hundreds of processing cores doing this period search and deriving the attributes. We fetch the data from database. We store the results. But at the same time, asynchronously, we publish the, the results. And we have the engine that does the, the, the aggregation on the fly. So the point of this is that you don't have to do, if you know the metrics, the, the, the aggregates that you want to do, you can predefine them. And basically, you have the result as you go. So you have the special engine. We're using Esper that uses SQL-like language. Uh, here we can see that we create a histogram object with some boundaries. We're putting some value in this. And, and the thing is processing. Uh, thing in batches. So every 10 seconds, it creates a, a snapshot of, of the state uh, of, the, of this value as, as being fetched from the stream. And then we store it in, in Postgres as, as 1D, 2D, whatever arrays. We can also have snapshots. And everything goes back, back to Postgres. When you can use R to, to display it or, or use some other, other tool like this, we have a dashboard that does uh, real-time monitoring. So this, are, this is normally stuff you would have to run SQL and wait hours. Or, or even days, so if you don't have proper hardware, if you don't distribute or parallelize the work. Mm. Okay, another thing is that we, I like Postgres, be, uh, is because we're able to distribute the data uh, within Postgres. We create appliances with the data with exactly the same schema as on the, on the distributed domain database, and we, we basically ship them as a, as a, as a virtual machines. So, uh, this is really good because we have a lot of development. This is also good to, to keep the users up to date with the, uh, with the new data that could come, simulated data, and so on. And we have some, some logic that does it automatically. So when we create new version of software, we can create the, the, the snapshot, uh, I mean, subset of the, of the data, create VM with this, and just publish it so they can use it. <coughs> now, X0. So who knows about XC? Zero here. OK. So this is a special kind of example how we would like to use XC. XC is the cluster database, is a distributed database when you have data nodes and coordinators. In principle, you need one, only, only one coordinator per the whole cluster of this dis distributed database. But I think everybody en ends up using coordinator plus data node on the same piece of hardware. Then you have Global Transaction Manager that is responsible for getting 
snapshots uh, for you, so the MVCC works, and, and you have clients. There are some adi additional very nice auxiliary projects for, for load balancing, for the, for the high availability, uh, like this, Jim, Jim uh, from, from Storm, Storm D, from Transla Translatis, is, he has written this. So you can, uh, you can automatically be, be forward when you connect on, on the connect to the least loaded machine. This is, uh, this is the setup we're aiming to have with Postgres XC. So in one node, this is one physical node, we have both primary and the secondary that is kind of skewed like RAID, similar to RAID 1E. When you have the primary that backs up to, to part of this one, this guy backs up to this one, and this is streaming replication to this one, and this one, this one. We have two enclosures right now. Actually, we have three, but we envision to use two for production and four nodes for, for the production as well. Uh, there's some uh, hand waving that could be done for integrating Pacemaker. Uh, this is our node. This is just, you know, don't read it. Just to show you that we have two, actually, we have four, 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 uh, four databases running, Postgres, da Postgres databases running on the one physical machine. The primary data, primary data node storage, primary coordinator, then backup data node, backup, back, backup data node, and backup coordinator. Um, and this is one scenario when one of the nodes dies. Uh, let's say this one, pacemaker is responsible for finding out who's responsible for replacing the, this guy. Uh, when when the machine is up, so. Okay, so coordinator is responsible for, for, sh for telling this guy that stop, stop streaming, there's no problem because this guy is, is dead. But this guy is becoming a primary. There's promotion for this one, so it's working as a replacement of this one. Once the, this, this machines are back, again, you have to have some logic from the from kind of coordinator, from the pacemaker to, to bring back and, and uh, orchestrate the stuff so you have the recovered, the primary, and you shifted all the, all the data that's backed up here to the, to the backup. Okay, all right, and we end up ending up with the same state as before, hopefully. Also, there is a, well, problem, but also possibility of adding new nodes. So when you have, uh, when you bought a new node, we should be able to edit pretty easily. It's not super easy right now, but we're hoping to, so both Postgres XC or Excel, they, they do this properly. So they do some kind of either background load balancing of the data or spreading of the data when you add the node or something like that. And there is many reasons why, why we choose Postgres and Postgres XC, but it's, I think you understand now why. Uh, and there's a number of priorities that are really important for us. So stability is first place, performance, partitioning. Partitioning is the, the big deal for us because of the, mm, not only because of the volume, but also the way we work. So we want to delete stuff, as you noticed. And when we want to delete, it's much better to drop the partition than delete from the table, right? So this is one of the things that would ease us, ease, ease our work. And this is more tricky when you have the distributed setup than on the single node. Mm, and many things were covered already during the talk, so we, we really keen on using column store. <coughs> we very like to use uh, nearest, nearest neighbor searches, on metrics, and typical, you know, analytical stuff. And hardware, okay, this is, I've, there was a talk about uh, the hardware optimization or Looking uh, on the on the on the I/O stress, so we did. I found it pretty pretty hard to believe, but I couldn't find few years ago. This is from four years ago, I think. Uh, the picture. There's no really set of OS parameters that are given if somebody wants to optimize, for example, for SSD uh, and random I/O. So what we ended up, uh, I ended up doing a script that does brute force search through the, the whole parameter space, and this is the correlation tree for SSD. <laughs> It show you for what parameters of the of the kernel. So, for example, the scheduler give you give you more or less highest median with, with the least spread, right? So, for example, I think this guy here looks good. Yeah, there's many way of doing this, but this is one of them. And in, in the end, it's proven to be helpful. So, you do this for for sequential, for random, for mixed. We, we use FIO uh, benchmarking tool for that. Ah, so this is R. So this is R again. So R has a lot of cool, uh, cool features. If, you, if there's paper written on statistics, it's probably implemented in R. And this is, uh, there's also AI, there's um, all this machine learning algorithms implemented. The problem with R is that it's memory constrained. So for many, for many things it's okay, for many things it's not. What was the optimal configuration for your system? Oh, it's quite complicated because you've seen there's four different, in the previous, this one, there's four different. No, but I mean on that graph. Ah, 
I don't remember right now, but I think this one. I can check if you want. Probably this one. If you see, you don't want to see the outlier here, right? Because that means something is potentially dangerous for you. So you want as, as short as possible and median as high as possible on this bar. So we have a num growing number of cores. We have a growing number of users. So this is our procurement plan for buying the hardware. We are here. We actually have 440 terabytes row storage bought from Dell, three enclosures, power vault. We have five machines, but actually four will be, as I said, will be used for production, will be used for test and development. And uh, yeah, so this is the whole question, how we partition the hardware now to have both primary and backup on the same node. Uh, and yeah, this is, I think, very important. We are. We want to be a power user of Postgres, especially Postgres XC or Excel. But it's super important for us that XC or Excel will merge into one thing. It would be really, really disaster, I think, if, if, if the two, mm, two efforts not the diverge into something co coherent. Uh, yeah, and production starts pretty soon. So we will be de deploying the, the, our system in next weeks. The hardware is there. We still have to, few, to do a few things for, the, for this OS configuration. and. To, we have to negotiate with a little bit with sysadmins because we do something else than everybody else in the in our data center. But this is the the end. Okay, questions. I just want to add that Postgres used in the Gaia also in the Cambridge group, which uh, uh, identify the new objects. So there is uh, this group led by Sergey Kopakov. Maybe you remember him. It's he was our former student. I think it's Brian. It's it's. Uh, it's David. No, it's David yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. But he worked yeah. in this group, and he was uh, our Google Talk student. And this group used uh, our contribution. We also use it. To the so yes, yeah, sorry, I, I yeah, should yeah. I should mention that we really have grateful there for for your work yeah. and for 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 the work so of Cambridge guys. So I should I should yeah I should put exclamation points. Uh, Postgres is super interesting for astronomers because of the special indexing support. Yeah. So this is spatial indices. Spatial, but also near nearest neighbor searches, yeah. uh, and basically the plug plugability. So you can cre create your own metrics and, and create your own uh, indexing scheme. We so this is super important for us. And we are we are waiting. Yeah. I'm waiting. Just yeah. Okay. Questions. For some, but usually you do you use parallax for for the objects that you are that you sure of. So if you see that the event, so we're also looking for the gravitational lensing events, you treat it differently. This is already some variable that has special meaning. So we don't use it for parallax probably then, because it would be too complicated to derive the proper parallax from it. You had a chart that showed your error rate as you added had an asymptote around 17% or something like that. Is there some significance to that number? Why 17%? Yeah, so I think there is also a there was research done about indexing, how many indices it makes sense or how complex index it makes sense before it degrades to sequential scan. So this is a general mathematical problem about uh, how dimensionality affects your, your optimization, right? Your, your, your perfect view. So there is no really the answer, but from what I know, 11 is the magic number. It's not 42. So if you go over 11, <laughs> if you go over 11, then then you probably have hard time finding some more interesting stuff. You have to do other tricks like principal component analysis. So then you fold your multiple dimensions onto one dimension, and you, there's some some stu stuff around that. So we do this as well. But uh, yeah, there's there's a number of ways how to how to find this number. This particular example is based on random forest uh, algorithm. And this algorithm is, is cool because it gives you the most significant attributes and it gives the weights. So you can see and, and remove the ones that are not interesting. It's just very slow, relatively slow to train. Yeah. Mm. How far does your instrument look? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> but it, you know, it's, no, it really depends on the luminosity of the, of the objects, right? I so yeah, but sorry, I, I don't remember. I don't I want to lie. But uh, it's, for example, if we see some, you can see some number of supernovas. We, we probably will see. 
So this is the galaxy. So you see, we're going almost to the to the end of the galaxy, right? And this is this is some this is this is parsecs. So, so it's inside the no, no. We also see quasars and other galaxies, but this is so much less in. Yeah, uh, I mean, in, in, in No, no, no. We can measure also the distance to the galaxies, but it's not as precise because obviously the further you go, the, the precision is, is lower. <coughs> and I think that for the faintest ones, we have more or less 20% precision. This is the aim, the ones that we see. You, somebody there was asking? The source ID. Ah, okay, so I should explain. So source ID for us is, is derived from the uh, partitioning of the sky. This is the, there are several partitioning schemes for the sky. We're using Helpix, which, which is basically gives you kind of um, rhomboidal, rhomboidal-like shapes, and, and it's hierarchical. So in this number, we actually have the number of the pixel, subpixel. We have three levels of subpixels. So it goes to more or less one degree uh, precision. And the, of course, depending, this is not enough because depending on the, on the, mm, of the, of the density of the sources in the sky, we might change this. So normally what we're going to do, we're going to get the first, there's another auxiliary data we have. Uh, it's called uh, the galactic, uh, there's some galactic, let's say, uh, statistics. We're going to take this, the kind of first data we have, and partition, do equivalent partitioning from that. And from this we derive our partitioning. But not us. <laughs> it's used because they were f they failed uh, with, with Oracle. Ah. So uh, this is a, like pseudo object oriented database that ha doesn't really have transactions and so on. This is, I think the, there are many reasons, but one of them is they, they failed with Oracle and they didn't, they were afraid to invest with something else. There's a number of con units that use Hadoop as well. So Cambridge uses Hadoop mostly. Not, not the transient. Group that you mentioned. They use Postgres. Okay, thank you.